Good evening. At 6.30, we have a quorum. We'll call a planning board meeting to order. First up for general information is Mr. Iser. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm back again for 132 Middle Street. We talked about it at the last meeting uh, about a potential common driveway or access over other than frontage, neither of which I'm asking about this evening. On the uh, just to remind everybody, that was a very small definitive subdivision. And one of the items on the plan was that the utilities were supposed to connect on Middle Street. The potential buyer would like to know if he can connect his utilities to Kosher Drive, if that's going to be an issue. That's item number one. And then item number two, the plan shows uh, a asphalt surface for the roadway. And this person would like to know if he can do uh, stone dust TRG instead of asphalt. So the two questions to the board regarding that. For the even, I'm assuming that'll be across Mr. Kosher's driveway? Or Correct, property? yes. As long as there's an easement granted for that to the town, that's fine. Okay. I'm and assuming then, he's gonna have an easement for it himself, right? Yes, he will. Okay, as long as there's a wide enough easement for the town to get to in case they ever need to, I don't have a problem with that. Okay, how about everybody else? It seems fine. Anybody else? Mike, Mark? Fine. Okay. Okay. Um, the, I don't have a problem with the TRG driveway either. Only question I would have is whether it is satisfactory to the fire department. Okay. Yeah. Well, I can certainly have him check that. If, if it is satisfactory to the fire department, then no issues. No, there'll still be drainage and everything else accordingly, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's just the driveway for that one, pro one residence, correct? That is right. So basically it's yeah. just a driveway. It's a private driveway. Right. Anybody okay. else have any issues? No. Okay. Okay, that's all I have for that. But while I've got you here, uh, I just, we've been talking a lot about, and if it's not the appropriate time, let me know. We've been talking a lot about potentially holding town meeting and trying to deal with a warrant. And I know the board has three or four articles on there. Is there anything that is absolutely necessary to have on the earliest warrant we can get at, or can your your stuff wait? What is it? What does wait mean? Till probably fall October. I mean, wait. I don't really know, Jimmy, because we we don't oh, know yeah, what I wait understand. truly means. I, but I, in in uh, hopefully October. I think the only thing that would probably really like to see on there would be, um, well, I mean, we can. Industrial parking. parking for sure. Industrial parking for sure. Well, I don't know that that's a big deal because he's not going to be doing much of that for the right time. For the time being. That's going to be, that could generate some serious discussion. I don't know. I mean. Yeah. I'm thinking that the only thing we may want to see would be the two trust fund articles. All right. Well, what I'm trying to do is get stuff that's not going to uh, incite conversation so that we can whip through this uh, if we even have the meeting. Uh, I mean, at some point, we obviously will, but uh, we're try if we do it on June, June 18th, like we're talking, I'm concerned there's not going to be a lot of people show up, number one. And if they do, they want to get out as quickly as possible. So. So I think the, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is perhaps, perhaps the most important because there is a pot of uh, money waiting for, a, uh, uh, for us to set up a way to receive it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that's going to generate a lot of negative discussion because the reason it was thrown out a number of years ago, we've addressed by not, by not allowing the... Um, committee to spend much money without town meeting or selectman's approval. So there was a concern once upon a time that the, the, the 
trust fund group could put the town into debt by themselves, and that's not possible any longer. Okay. All right. Well, just uh, you know, think about it. If you, if something really needs to happen, we'll. I mean, we're going to keep keep uh, evolving the warrant and what's going to be on it. Uh, so if you have any issues, just let somebody know and we'll try to take care of it. Okay. All right. Very good. And are you talking about Megan's way at all tonight? No, we have no more information from uh, DPW on that. The uh, DPW director is in quarantine because he went to the hospital with a family member and was exposed and has been told to stay away from town. Okay. Uh, and his deputy, D.D. Deepern D.C. has been talking with the deputy, but I think there may be a question of whether he thinks it might exceed his acting powers. Okay. All right. Now, then I don't, you won't need me to answer any questions relative to that. Uh, I, do, do you think you need me for anything else this evening? Oh, uh, one thing, uh, we have now sent the one signature letter into the Registry of Deeds. Okay. So uh, if you want to get that ANR plan that we approved at the last meeting signed, you can contact me or Jim or Joe. Okay. Any one of us has the authority to sign on behalf of the board now. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. All right, I think that's all I need. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a good night. Have a good night. Larry. You're up. I've unmuted. Sorry. That's okay. Somebody rang the doorbell so the dogs went crazy. <laughs> so I've been asked to, um, if I could attend this meeting, um, to talk about the Ulta signage. Yes. So I didn't know if you would like to present me with questions, if you would like to just have me present what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we do it, whatever you'd like, sir. Why don't you just tell us what you want to do? Okay. So back in December, I contacted the city and I spoke to um, Tim Nyhart. Yeah. And Tim had mentioned to me that the, the way that because I wanted to prepare a plan for Ulta to go to the landlord and say, this is what we can do. So Mr. Nyhart told me that what I needed to do was I needed to look at the Pier 1 sign and do a measurement of that sign and then make sure that the sign I was proposing wasn't bigger than that sign in square footage. So I shared an email with Mr. Nyhart um, and as I had mentioned before, I, I've been doing staple signs for 20 years. So I kind of know the way these backgrounds work. So Staples has a red background, Pier 1 has a blue, some of my other clients have blue. So what I did was I measured the blue area as the signage for Pier 1, that being five foot six inches by 30 feet. Um, I prepared the drawing and then I sent it to Mr. Nyhart. Um, but I got a response from his office that he had shingles and he was having difficulty seeing and that he wouldn't be answering me. Um, I, I don't know if that's consistent with, with what you've heard from that office, but um, you know, that's, that's what had happened. So right. what I did was I prepared the right. Yes. Just so we can update you on that. Mr. Nyhart has since retired. Middle of April was his last working day. The new building inspector is Tom Quinlan Jr. Okay. Just for your information. Okay. Well, that's great. I uh, I hope he is um, healthy and happy. M Mr. Nyhart, that is after you know from what I'm assuming shingles is not a good not a good feeling thing. So. What I did was I took that information that um, Mr. Nyhart gave me and I prepared the Ulta package accordingly to make sure that our signage was smaller actually than the Pier 1 signage. So I prepared, I prepared drawings based on 165 square feet of current Pier 1. Um, the signage that we've asked for 
um, is 128 square feet. We've also got a small blade sign so people down the way, if they're at a different store, can see that there's an Ulta. Okay, so can I just interrupt for a minute? Is that the same sign package that Ruth Shim sent to me this afternoon? Well, all I can do is hold it up. If that well, let me let me see if I can go into screen sharing again. I think it's what I saw on your screen. It looks that like looks that. like it. Yeah, yeah that looks like it. That's the same one that I sent over. Okay. okay. Is that useful at all? That's what I'm looking at right now. Get this to all board members, but. We'll leave it up for discussion purposes. Okay, so that is, that's how I got to what we have proposed here tonight. Um, and I know that, you know, we, we are before the board to ask for approval of this package. Okay. So as I explained in my email to Ruth, the, um, Basically, all the sign packages in that mall are pre-existing non-conforming items. Uh, the, the bylaw has been changed, but as long as you're within the parameters of what you're replacing, we would not allow uh, internally illuminated signage on new construction. But uh, as long as you're within the parameters of what you're replacing, that seems fine. Yeah, and according to according to the information that Mr. Nye has gave me, um, I feel we're 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 very much within that bill. So the 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 sign will be internally illuminated. Yes, sir. It'll be internally illuminated. Okay. The faces are gray during the day, and then um, through the magic of the 3M film on the face, they'll turn white at night. Okay. And it's a pretty standard industry film. It's just, it's a, it's a gray film with a million little dots in it. Okay. I'm gonna ask the question, if it's not possible, that's fine. Is there any, any way that could be made um, a backlit sign? Um, it, it could be, yes, sir. It, it just wouldn't, it wouldn't fit in with the rest of the center, whereas everyone else would have, you know, illuminated letter sets. Um, we, it, it could be made. I, I, I won't tell you it couldn't be. Um, Ulta truly would like it to be, you know, illuminated faced like the rest of the signs in the center. Okay. Now the awning, you have, uh, you have signage on all three awnings. And is okay. that uh, factored into your calculation for area? Yes, sir. Um, those are less than one square foot each. So let's just call them two for sake of argument. Um, that if it was two square feet, they're only four inches tall. Um, so if they were two square feet, that's six square feet on the awning. Um, again, rounding up five square feet on the blade sign and 129, 128 square feet on the sign. So um, it would be a hundred and 2,839, sorry, 139 square feet versus the 165 square feet that, that you know, I had mentioned earlier in my, in my comments. Now, are those awnings illuminated underneath? No, sir. Okay. The, uh, just for, because you're adding more quantity of signs than you have today, you're, you're putting in, the way I read it, five signs? Well, with the with the valence copy, um, Jim, yes, it would be. It, there's five readings of Ulta, yes. Sir. Okay. You need to. Ex you can't have more than four. Okay. Um, what I could do, um, if it would, you know, if it would help the board, I could just get rid of the copy on all three awnings. Well, I'm, I'm just saying you're allowed four signs. Yeah. So the problem. The problem is, is if I take it off of one of the awnings it'll kind of look off center. So instead of just going four, I would just take the copy off of all three awnings. Okay, all right. That way it, it just visibly looks better. Okay. So then we down to 132 square feet. 
132 square feet. Yeah. So, so what are the dimensions on that Alta sign? Clearly, it's wider than the Pier One imports, right? Um, it, it, seven feet tall by 19 feet wide. The issue becomes because of the Ulta National um, mark, they call it the ribbon. It, it kind of throws out of whack the actual size of the sign. So square footage wise, it is less. It's just because of that, the way that the logo is used. Um, and it really isn't used by any other national retailers, a logo like that. Um, and it is on over 1,200 of their stores across the country. So when you're, you're going to have the blade sign and the big altar sign, if that's correct? Yes, sir. I'll, I'll, and I didn't see who said that. I'm sorry. Um, I, will, I will change the drawings to remove the three altars, Ulta Beauty on each one of the awnings. Okay. And, that, and, and it's because, again, if it's four, it won't look right if I, if I put you know, ones on the outside or just the one in the middle. So I think it'll just be more attractive if I just remove all three. Okay. okay. Any other discussion? So the no. other item um, it, we're involved is the actual change of use from um, retail to health and beauty. Um, and they did provide a narrative that I sent around that basically said that they sell beauty, they, they, there'll be retail and salon services, all of which are allowed in the district. It, will they be do, just selling beauty products or will they actually be doing the salon as well? Yes, all Ulta's, all Ulta's have a salon in the back of the store. Okay, so will be a salon. Yeah, a large part of the store is products. So the base, the options that would be on the building, I don't know if they have a picture of the, the particular configuration where you're having just because they don't. <laughs> but I mean, did you, are you asking me to have someone draw the picture then? I could potentially do that. We would like to see a picture of what will be constructed. We aren't fussy where the windows are, first floor, second floor, two, three, one, where the door is, what the size of the door is. It's not, a, it's not really what we're after here. We just want to see a picture, a real picture of what will be constructed. Because for people to say, well, it's going to be this, but it won't have this, it won't have this. You know, we've got, we have five members and they each have a different vision in their head. And when it's finally built, it may be, well, that's not what we thought. Okay, so, so if I take the photograph, I think you asked, said take the photograph and put some markups to show where the, the, um, the door and the rest will be. Or, I mean, I, I, don't, I can't get a photograph of a building that doesn't exist. So I can have someone either draw something or I can mark up the picture I sent earlier. Yeah, I'd like to see an accurate elevation. I mean, I, I don't know, Jim, if that's what, you know, I'd like to see them draw an elevation of what it's going to look like and not stand alone, but next to the building. So we'd see how its height relates and what it's going to actually look like from the street. And, and didn't Janet Stone from Conservation, not, not that this is our purview, say something that might be an issue with wetlands? No, said, I'm not sure what our final the top, top, uh, comment was on that. You remember, Bill, does she have a comment on the wetlands on that one yet? Uh, yes. I think I forwarded it around, but let me. Yeah, she said that the um, the drainage basins, she had to find out if they were filed as wetlands or not. So it sounded like she was still looking into it. Is okay. the way I read it. So what she said is it is right next to the detention basin, which may or may not be a problem. If they are old enough and have not been maintained, the detention the basins can still qualify as wetlands as well. So he, she wanted to check out the file for the original approval. But any approval we get is subject to other board approval. Yes, but it looks like we're not ready to vote anything tonight no. anyway, so she may have an answer um, by our next meeting. 
No, the basins were modified uh, when they added the uh, second story and did the modifications, but it will let Concom makes that call. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, um, for the drawing you're requesting, I'm is, is uh, I'm not familiar with that. Is that something Mark Darnold knows how to do, or is that something I have an architect do? You're probably going to need an architect to do that. If you do, you really need a perspective of the um, the shed in relationship to the existing school. I don't think that he needs a perspective. I think just a two dimensional elevation. I don't know. Maybe I'm well, the only one that that wants to see how that looks from the street. I think, I think, I think if think. it's if it stayed behind the building, I wouldn't care. But now that it's out front, I kind of want to see how it's going to look. Okay. I don't think you'll be able to see it from the street, but that's no. Uh, well, if you look at the full site plan, I think you'd have a really tough, tough time seeing that from the street. Will that be visible from the street? If you're asking me, it's well back from the street. I mean, I don't know whether you'd see the top of it from the street or not. Uh, I, I mean, I'd have to have someone look at it, but it's it's um, it, it's well back and away from the street. So, um, but I couldn't say with authority one way or another. Is there probably, any probably 400 feet back from the street at least maybe 500? Isn't it closer to the street than the than the main building? Not no, no it's it's near the rear of the building. I mean the front of the building is probably another 150 feet from this. I suspect the, the only place you're going to see it from the street is if you're driving by and looking into the uh, Mountain Farms Mall parking lot, you might see it beyond the parking lot. Um, actually, from the parking lot, it would be obstructed by our building. The, mm -hmm. it, it, the only way you could see it from a street would be on Route 9 if you were looking between our building and the uh, Subaru dealership. And so, and, and again, it's, it's well back and there's at least this gentle slope in the front of the, um, the site, so I don't know whether you could see anything or not. But the, uh, you know, it's it's in a part of Hadley that has little, little ambiance. I don't think it's going to ruin ruin the view too much. I see it's forward of the addition, but it's behind the existing front. All right. It, it, yeah, it's it's sort of sort of adjacent to the very rear of the original uh, structure. Right. Right. But it's in front of the the addition. That's correct, and it's it's close to the um, the soup. Um, so it's it's sort of hidden away in that context. But I mean, it, it okay. might. I mean, and that would get into whether. I mean, I know that there are rules about having couplers and stuff like that. I mean, if you put a couple on it, you might see it because it's high enough that you would. Um, so you guys can decide whether you want that or not. We're flexible about putting that on. I, I don't think um, we need a cool it's, it's not it's not going to be visible from the street, so I, that will be visible from the bike path. That's about it. Yeah. Um, I don't think. I yeah. don't think you need. A, I don't think you need a cupola on it. Okay. No. But, I mean, something that Mark probably could draw would just be a picture of uh, one side is going to face the building, your your existing building, right? Yes. And it's going to be how many feet away from the building? Um. I, I would guess about depends. 40 feet. Okay. The, 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 from the original building, it's on the opposite side of the detention pond, and it's actually uh, closer to the car dealership on, on right. that in, in terms of the right. positioning. It is right. close to the corner of the addition, um, and so I don't know how many feet that is, but in terms of the original building, it's, it's well away from that. Okay, yeah. you know, r rather than get, you may just want to give us a picture of the four sides of the building. Okay. The 7-3D view, just to, you know, four 2D views, if you would. Yeah. Okay, and, and, and again, um, am I having someone draw, draw this or am I taking the photograph that was supplied by the uh, vendor 
and showing you where things are located by having arrows saying this is where the door will be. I prefer to see a draw picture. Okay, we'll do that. Not a marked up picture. Okay. And and again, I my expectation is we'll use essentially the color scheme and and the rest as shown in the picture, just because that seems like a pretty. I mean, that's I that, think that's, compatible with the existing building yeah. and yeah. the rest. That should be fine. Yeah, I don't think it has to be an artist's rendering, but just black and white drawn to scale. Okay. Well, we have an architect I think can do uh, give us a, a drawing. Now you're saying that we should wait. At some level, we should wait to hear from the um, conservation commission person. And, and um, yeah, be, be, well, if you're too close to the wetland, you become a wetland issue. You may have to. Well, I mean, you could be. All you'd have to do is move the building someplace else. But the, I mean, we built an addition right next to that detention pond, so it wasn't viewed as a wetland at that time. We we don't we don't for. Um, bill with regards to the affordable um, the affordable units language um, and maybe I, I guess do you want to talk about what we're what I've been up to um, up to the point of talking about affordable housing with you or because there I, I haven't really done any I don't have any product um, regarding the um, the uh, we were working on the um, planning and regs that we wanted to also include stormwater regulations in that discussion. I know after speaking to Patty Gambarini, um, I think that there was probably one sort of um, she wanted to have one meeting with the working group to to fine tune what that final product was going to look like. Um, and that's specific to her work. Um, and, you know, with, with all of the um, confusion about the billing, I think I've finally got a green light for, you know, now I have a different code to, a, to charge the work that I'm doing with you all. Um, but um, I think where we left off with regards to stormwater, there's probably one more meeting she would like to have with the, um, working group to um, smooth that product off. And then what I imagined based on our last meeting in February um, was that, um, you know, either concurrently or right after we can um, review a, a, a uh, document which would have planning board rules and regs based on the various documents that you've shared with me um, and that I think you've explored at some points um, in the past on, on how to create a, a um, inclusive document with regulations from um, all of the bylaws that suggest that you need one. Um, so you're um, suggesting that the stormwater regulations will be with a part of a lar our larger regulations package. Well, I think I think you wanted to, unless unless I didn't understand correctly. Um, you know, the regulations. I, I think you wanted to have um, a public hearings to include both um, an approval of the stormwater regulations as well as the planning board's um, rules and regs. Um, so. You know, I think it was just the timing that needed to be, um, you know, finessed and, and um, but at the end of the day, um, either can happen before or after. Um, but I think it was just for the, uh, the, the reason that you wanted to have them in one public hearing. No, I think you're remembering it correctly. If we, if we were going to, as we're talking about the stormwater regs, and there would also have to be some tweaks to our subdivision regs to conform to the stormwater regs. And if we're having a public hearing on both of those, it would make sense to address, to adopt overall regs as well. But I think we could do the stormwater and the stormwater part of subdivision separately if we had to, but I, 
I think we everything's been bumped back another six months or another year. Yeah, so for the stormwater regs, the thing is you have the bylaw in place and the bylaw allows the, um, the bylaw, which is, um, is in compliance with the new MS4 permit. The, as far as that town is safe, um, as, as you are aware, Bill, the, um, and probably the board, uh, those um, rules had to actually were pushed out to 2021, the summer of 2021. So where we were trying to work up to June 30th of this year, um, since then, EPA has moved that deadline to 2021, the summer of 2021. So in fact, the, the town has adopted um, the, the, uh, the bylaw at the very least. We were working towards um, completing the regulations, which we would do um, eventually during this time. Um, but you're right, there is some, some time um, to play with. Um, but I think that, you know, this may be the reality. So for, you know, a few more months at the very least, um, exploring a way to um, get Patty to work with the town to finish the work with regards to that. And, you know, I can, um, as I have been doing with other communities, look at the stormwater regulations um, or, or the, sorry, the subdivision regulations and see how they fit in. Um, I don't think that there is any major haul to it. Um, it is, and, and I think at the end of the day, I think um, we're presenting um, areas within the subdivision regulations that are suggesting um, green infrastructure or lid, um, low impact development um, where applicable or where feasible. Um, and so I think that's going to be what the, the nature of the, the suggested ed edits would be to the subdivision regulations with regards to stormwater. Um, the, but, uh, go the ahead. The US-4 getting pushed off to 2021 was done before everybody was confined to nowhere. Right. So that, that could even move more out. That's very true. Um, that is very true. Um, and, uh, you know, it, I guess it, it, it's at the direction of the board how I think based on my understanding and I think based on um, the town administrator with regards to that funding mechanism, I don't know um, for the work for the stormwater what the deadline is of that money. Um, but I know that, you know, through planning board assistance with my work with the board, it is fiscal year. So, you know, we'll be exploring a new contract for the following year, should you want to, um, you know, re, uh, to re up. Um, so we have budgeted for an increase. Um, it's going through finance committee now. So we'll see what comes out on the other end. But, and, that, uh, and, and that's contingent on the uh, town meeting approval, correct? Right. In, in the meantime, Ken, Maybe what we should be doing because the time is getting close to us is prepare a contract for next fiscal year beginning, uh, what is it, July 1, Bill? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. We, even if we just use the same $7,500, we can always amend that after the fact if it gets approved. Whenever, because the town meeting right now won't be is scheduled for late June. So it's going to be very tight to use that. So it'd be, it'd be nice if we could at least get this $7,500 contract going in the meantime. And we can always amend it after. And um, remember that uh, and there are, are uh, I'm going to dig that out. Uh, maybe I'll even send it around again because there were some things in there that we didn't get to five and six years ago that are still relevant, but they just kind of got passed by or were overtaken by something that was more pressing. Yeah. So um, I think it would be useful to spend some time looking at the work program and deciding what we want to focus on. 
apart from some things like this that we have to focus on. Yeah. Uh, can the, um, the funding for stormwater compliance comes out of a warrant article, which means it's basically, uh, it's gonna, it, it's, until, it's until we run out of work or run out of money. Okay. There's, so, no end, there's no end date on it per, per se, but we don't want to drag it out forever either. Obviously. Right. Um, okay. Well, that's good to know. I'll, I'll share that with Patty. I, you know, I think um, more than likely Jim Patty will be reaching out um, with regards to maybe setting up a schedule for at least one virtual meeting with the working group. Um, kind of refreshing everyone's okay you know um where 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 we were with the process right that, that's fine we can do that okay um so i think if we're shifting gears um bill you had sent out some examples of language from bylaws across the commonwealth that were related to high um, payments in lieu of units um i guess um, and this is re this is in regards to your inclusionary zoning Correct. Um, section of your zoning bylaw. Um, I guess the, the question is, is there, were you looking at it to amend or, or add a, a section? Because looking at kind of your past town meeting um, minutes, it looked as if you removed um, possibly a section that was related to that. We, we did uh, because the, the at the time we adopted inclusionary zoning, there was a companion article for an affordable housing trust fund. The okay. trust fund did not pass, the inclusionary zoning did. So we had this mismatch. They had the dangling provision for payment in lieu, um, but nowhere to pay it to. And it wasn't an issue for years because nothing was being built that was triggering the inclusionary zoning. Okay. Uh, it became an issue with the senior housing on East Street and when the developer really was looking for a way to make uh, payments in lieu rather than try to figure out how to manage affordability on site. Uh, so we decided we had taken out the language what we initially adopted affordability inclusionary zoning it had the language in it we then amended inclusionary zoning to delete that language we would now like to add it back in okay. but we realized that the original language we used was so open-ended it didn't provide any basis for calculating compare that to our transfer development rights bylaw which is very specific about the funding formula and what what you have to make, what you have to pay, and what you get for what you pay. Mm -hmm. um, we just don't have that piece. Now, uh, after I did my research, um, Mike came up with an idea as well. Um, I think the first thing we want to think about is um, clearly, as you look through the options there. Uh, the various things that various towns have adopted. In some cases, it seems very apparent that the town wants to discourage payment in lieu. Yeah. Uh, in question? other cases, they seem to yeah. want to work with the, the developer. It seemed kind of arbitrary, too. There was no mathematical reason for coming up with these numbers, I thought. They were just, you know, pull them off the wall and see what sticks. And I I'm not a lawyer, but I, Bill's used the phrase arbitrary, arbitrary and capricious in the past. And I thought most, most of these uh, uh, statements of what should be contributed were arbitrary and capricious. They had no basis what was really the, what the value of the product was. Three times the median standard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, whose measurement of median would they be using? Would it be DHCDs and HUDs oh. um, with regards to you know the uh, um, the affordability factor, the eighty percent of the annual median income? I think in, 
in my experience in working um, on a few cases where inclusionary zoning and 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 uh, communities wanting to adopt um, payment in lieu of units, um, I've seen it done similarly as as um, as Bill had provided to you all. I, I do think that um, maybe a building um, industry standard based on um, how much it, co it costs to create well, a single that, unit. That's kind of getting there, but the question is, what is the value of the subsidy that's being provided? And the, I'll just give my spiel as to what I came up with. The value of the subsidy that's being provided is what it costs to build the unit versus what the rents are gonna be for that unit. Mm -hmm. That difference is essentially what's being subsidized. And so my idea was to come up with a number. What does it cost to build the affordable unit? And speaking with uh, Jimmy Maximoski last week, we said, well, let's go with the 1400 square, uh, square foot unit, building whatever. The wholesale cost of building one of those uh, right now is $85 a square foot. So to build 1,400, 1400 square feet is gonna cost $119,000. What is the cost of the land that you're gonna put that on? That's a variable, I said 120,000. So we've got a total construction cost, wholesale plus land cost of 239,000. Do we include in that insurance and taxes? For purposes of this illustration, I didn't. So another variable here is the cost of money. 15 year mortgage, two and three quarters right now, the cost of money is pretty low. So amortizing that $239,000 as if it were a mortgage over a 15 year period, you would have a total cost in today's dollars of about $292,000, okay? So that's one number, 292,000. And that number can change if you throw insurance in or taxes for that 10 year period. But we're doing it in today's dollars. The next question is, what are the rents? I asked uh, someone over at the uh, head of the uh, senior center what the highest rent was in town. It's $900 for a two bedroom unit. So taking 900 times 15 years, times 12 months a year, you come up with $162,000, okay? In present dollars. So the value of that subsidy for 15 years is $292,000 versus 162,000, which says you should be putting into the trust $130,000. And we can back that number up mathematically. There's sure. certain variables there, but at least we can back the number up and it's not just saying it's gonna be three times the average income or, or some, some, some other number. We can back it up mathematically. I think it's defensible. So I'm uh, just curious. I just said, the only thing we need to verify out of that is Mike got the number from the senior center on the rent in Hadley. What we need to verify that is, is what is the subsidized rent or the maximum rent that a family could afford for a house like that? Because there is that, that number exists. I just don't know what it is. There's a maximum number that for the median income of all the, the subsidized, the, that well, kind of stuff. Yeah, she told me that, I assume that was a subsidized rent. And so she told me $900 for a two bedroom. That sounds, sounds like a subsidized to me. But it could be wrong. But yeah, that's a variable. That's a variable. Yeah, all I'm saying is that needs to be verified. What and is that, that shouldn't be difficult to do. Yeah, and the other question would be, do we include in the amortization, do we add 15 years worth of insurance and taxes? Because we're doing it in present dollars, today's dollars, okay? And so we're not going to put any inflation factor in or anything. The only inflation we got is the two and three quarters, which is not two and three quarters inflation. It's the cost of money. So... So where I get confused is why you are calling it rent. Because what, what the assumption is, the assumption is that people aren't going to be buying these properties. They're going to be renting these properties. And I thought we talked about this before because generally if you're subsidizing uh, living situations, perhaps you're not going to be able to qualify for a mortgage to buy something. No. But the yeah. rental, the rental situation, that's not all that complex. I don't think you know. Uh, Winfield is able to manage that, 
The problem that we're really wrestling with is the uh, Barry Roberts problem. I'm not worried about whether they're renting it or buying it. I'm just saying, what is the value of the subsidy? It doesn't matter if they're renting it at all. But we, there, we have to put a value on the subsidy. And the, sub, and the subsidy is going to be basically, in very simple terms, what it costs to build it and what the rents are going to be for that. The difference is what the subsidy is. And it, we, we need, we need to be, because clearly it's going to cost somebody something. You've got an opportunity cost here. It's going to cost somebody something to live there somehow. The, and like I said, we need to simply verify the number. Because they got it from the senior center for the rent. Is that a valid number? I don't know. Was, it might be. That was apparently that was apparently the highest. I asked for the highest rents. We could go with the lowest rent. When I when I got the the, the uh, number, uh, a member of the community is running for select board was there, and she said, "I wish we could bring that down." Well, I can't. I can't change that. It is what it is. You know. My my only my only point is that there is a number. Yeah. The state puts out. For, for maximum subsidized for, for the family of what is for this area, there is that number in existence from the state. Yeah, so so basically every time this issue comes up, we're gonna have to, here's my, you know, this is my back of the envelope dissertation. We're gonna have to do a calculation. What is the whole, and we're gonna have to agree on, is there gonna be a 1400 square foot house or unit? What's the wholesale cost of building that? What is the land cost? Do we include insurance and taxes? That's the total cost. But those are the variables. Every time we come up with this, then we're gonna to have to determine what the rent is. And I just came up with a 15 year mortgage, amortized it over 15 years. I figured maybe that'd be the turnover for something like this, but we could do a 30 year, but I think 13 is more. If you did a 30 year, then You'd be probably be contributing a hell of a lot more to the, the trust, okay? Your calculations make good sense, Mike. I'm not questioning what you're oh, saying. No, I, but I'm just I mean, saying that we, we we need to look at what the like I said, get get back away. We gotta find out from the from the state for our area what is that magic number for rent or mortgage, whatever you want to call it, verify and then we the number does it make sense for what we want to put into the bylaw? That's all. Yeah. So this is a little thing I just wrote up. The amount to be paid into the Hadley uh, Affordable Housing Trust shall be calculated as follows. One, determine the total 15 year cost of the affordable housing unit, including wholesale construction costs, land costs, insurance costs for 15 years, and taxes for 15 years in present dollars. This total will then be amortized over a 15 year period utilizing the then 15 year fixed mortgage rate as published by the East Hampton Savings Bank. From one above, subtracting, subtract the total amount of rent which, which would be paid over the 15 year period in today's dollars. This number will give the dollar amount to be paid into the insurance trust. Pretty simple calculation. But you know, you can massage it any way you want. At least right. we, we can try to value the value what's being given rather than saying pulling something out of the air. So, and, and that that's trouble that that's fine and then we can look at the number is it a number that we want to go with i mean i don't know how well because what mike has presented makes logical sense for the donation i need some comments you guys i need some feedback <laughs> no it sounds good I, I kind of imagine that we would have to revisit those numbers every three to five years well we're going to have to revisit them every time the issue comes up yeah yeah well i would suggest that based on some of the based on some of the examples that uh bill provided um there is um i i can't remember the one town but it would be review of a pro forma that they would probably be presenting to you um to the board um and that because it requires a, a permit is it a, is it a special permit um that you would, um, part of your condition would include that condition of approval. I guess, is, is that how, I, it, it sounds as if the, the, the town has not yet um, done this um, payment in lieu. Well, we have gone through the exercise where uh, 
um, the senior housing off of East Street got a variance to make a payment in lieu, even though we didn't have a vehicle to hold it because they were having such demonstrated difficulty figuring out and the backside of um, selling affordable properties. So uh, we went through an exercise with the developer and it more or less followed the, uh, the pattern that Boylston on the first page uh, talks about uh, the final contribution for each affordable unit should be equal to the difference between the average market sale price for the market unit and the purchase price deemed affordable to a, a four person low income household. So it, it has the advantage of a, you know, there, there was a logic to how we got there. Basically, we're getting the developer's profit, but would have been the developer's profit on four units, which I think were the, the affordable requirement. But a lot of Do you recall how much we got in, Bill, for each one? Do you recall how much? Uh, I don't off the top of my head. Um, what was that question, Mike? Do you recall how much? Barry Roberts paid for each unit. You know, no, this calculation I, is, is I know what I know the approximate total that is sitting in the fund. Yeah. So there's about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars in the fund, which equates to about ten thousand dollars per unit of the entire development. Yeah. I right? think there's thirty-four units and there's three hundred and fifty about 350,000, basically 10,000 a unit. Well, so he's actually putting more in. So let me, let me oh, pull that up. units? So 15,000 a unit. Uh, well, that would come thousand per. You know, so the formula isn't wacky. Okay, <laughs> it's not wacky. No, you've done good work, Mike. Thank you. Yeah. Finally, my Wharton education is coming in handy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hang on a second, and I will get. I've set this around before, but I'll. Uh, I'm just going to print it out again. Um. You, uh, some numbers, and this is more on the side of why we need uh, uh, Ken, excuse me, Bill, in your experience in terms of affordable housing, what percentage are rentals and what percentage are purchases? Um, when I was dealing with affordable housing, it was all rentals. So, um, because I was working in large cities that had yeah. um, visionary zoning, all right. um, you know, my experience with is with with um, home sales is that or home ownership is, um, you know, the provision that those those uh, units in a subdivision. Uh, let's just use that as an as a quick example. Um, would remain affordable per um, the HUD standard um, for affordability and deed restricted, or there would be the follow through with the deed. Um, and this was um, in Florida when. Yeah. When so. So so, if if someone wanted to purchase as opposed to rent and they they could meet the criteria, the bank's criteria, income uh, ratios and credit, blah, 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 down payment if necessary. In order to be remain affordable, a cap would be placed on any potential appreciation the original purchaser might enjoy in the, in a,
I would have to check that. It makes sense logically. Yeah. So, so my question is, why does someone would someone want to invest in a property if they can't, over time, gain as a capital gain the appreciation of that property? That it doesn't doesn't make any sense to me. But you know. Well, I think there probably are some examples where it's more important to get off the street and into a house than financial gain on it. 